you can reduce your risk for most cancers, including breast cancer, down to almost zero. And that's regardless of your genes. Now, I hope you understand the magnitude of the statement I've just made, and that this short video is enough to empower you to want to learn more. Because too often, there's a very serious and very harmful mismatch between what the legitimate scientific community knows and what the medical industrial complex chooses to inform the public. An unfortunate example of such misinformation is a top story on breast cancer that was highlighted in the media recently. It involved actress Angelina Jolie and her decision to have an elective double mastectomy. She had both of her breasts removed, not because she had cancer, but because the genetic tests show that she carries a mutation in her BRCA gene that is said to increase her risk. Now this brings us to the obvious genes versus environment conversation. What plays a bigger role? Your genes or your environment? Is it 50-50? Are you doomed if you have a certain gene mutation? Or does it even make a difference at all? Well, let's see what science tells us. In what may be the largest study ever to compare the role of genes versus the environment in cancer, Dr. Paul Lichtenstein and his team examined the health records of nearly 90,000 Scandinavian twins. And they analyzed the patterns of cancer in both monozygotic twins, meaning they share all of their genes, and dizygotic twins, meaning they share some genes. The results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'll quote, we conclude that the overwhelming contributor to the causation of cancer in the populations of twins that we studied was the environment. Now let's talk about the most important epidemiological study on nutrition and disease ever conducted. Dr. Colin Campbell examined disease rates in 65 counties in China, all with genetically similar populations living very similar lives. So you would not suspect that cancer rates would vary much from one county to another, especially not if you believe that genetics plays a big role. But as it turned out, the range in cancer rates going from highest to lowest was several dozen fold to a couple of hundred fold, depending on the cancer. As a comparison, in North America, it's only two to three fold at most. How could you have such a huge range in cancer rates in a population that is so genetically homogeneous? The answer, of course, is that it has very little to do with genes to begin with. And what happened when someone living in a low cancer region migrated to an area with higher rates of cancer? You guessed it that person's risk of developing cancer increased. Did their genes magically change? No. Their environment changed. Their diet changed. In the counties where people ate the most animal-based food, rates of cancer were higher. And this is consistent with all of Dr. T. Colin Campbell's four decades of scientific research. He's published over 300 papers in peer-reviewed medical journals, as well as his best-selling book, The China Study, where he teaches us the compelling evidence that consuming an animal-based diet is the best predictor for diseases, such as breast cancer, and how a whole foods plant-based diet is the answer to minimizing your risk. And if anybody starts screaming that these are just observations, and that correlation does not equal causation, then it means that they haven't read the science, and more importantly, they are being manipulated into defending big industries without even realizing it. It wasn't too long ago that the tobacco industry was saying the same thing, going on about how there was no science to prove that cigarettes cause cancer. They wanted to see cause and effect. For them to admit anything back then, you would almost have to put human test subjects in a lab, like rats, have them smoke all day for a month, and then let them out and see if they all develop cancer. And if they didn't, then clearly smoking did not cause cancer. Of course, this is silly. And that's not how legitimate science sees things anymore when it comes to most diseases. The tobacco industry was eventually brought down by legitimate science and a growing awareness. We got more educated. Today, we see correlations between diet and disease that are even greater than that of smoking and lung cancer. And we also understand more about the mechanisms of action by which food increases or decreases risk for diseases in the human body. We are learning more every day about how all of this works. Dr. Colin Campbell was literally able to turn on and turn off cancer cells in rats just by controlling the amount of animal protein he fed them. Plant protein did not turn on cancer. Animal protein did, like a switch. Add to this the thousands of studies that explain how foods have an incredible ability to prevent and reverse disease, and then add the many statistically significant correlations between diet and disease seen in a genetically homogeneous population, such as China. And if you are still screaming that this is just an observation, 
then you would have probably also defended the tobacco industry just a few decades ago. This is what we call science-based evidence. It's not convenient for big industries, and it's normal for them to rebel against it. But as people, we just have to be more educated in understanding where the real science is and where the evidence points to. Moving on, let's just quickly bring up one more interesting study that compared Asian American women who were born in the East to Asian American women who were born in the West. And you guessed it, the women who were born in the West and who were fully immersed in American culture had six times the risk of developing breast cancer than those that were born in the East and then later migrated to the West. The more they kept their Asian traditions, the lower their risk for breast cancer. And over and over again, migrational studies clearly demonstrate that when you migrate from a region of low incidence to a region of higher incidence of cancer, your risk increases. There is only one conclusion. Environment plays the biggest role in cancer development. And when we look at breast cancer, which is the most commonly occurring cancer in women in Western societies, the incidence is five times higher in rich Western countries than in developing poorer countries. Dr. Campbell calls cancer a disease of affluence, one of nutritional extravagance that comes from living in a wealthy society. And this is sad. Sad. The standard American diet, rich in meat and dairy. Now you may be saying, hold on, hold on a minute. You're talking about food and that's great. We know the implications, we know how important food is for the development and or prevention of disease. But what about the other well-documented risk factors for breast cancer? such as early age of first menstruation, late menopause, high exposure to female hormones, or high blood cholesterol. Well, all of these risk factors can be attributed to an animal-based diet. For example, a study published by the Journal of Public Health Nutrition examined 3,000 girls and found that girls on a high meat diet are more likely to start their periods early and thus increase their risk for breast cancer and heart disease. And this information is consistent with Colin Campbell's study in China, where the average age when girls began their period was 17 years old. Compare that to the average age of 11 that is typically seen in North America. Beginning your period early leads to higher levels of hormones, such as estrogen, pumping through your blood. And as long as you stay on an animal-based diet, this continues throughout your reproductive years, which in turn also increases your age of menopause by about four years. In short, since you are getting your period earlier than you should and experiencing menopause later, your body has about an extra 10 years of exposure to female hormones. So if anybody tells you that breast cancer is due to hormones and has nothing to do with nutrition, you can tell them that they are correct regarding the hormones, but then they need to understand how hormonal levels are affected by the consumption of animal foods. Switch to a healthier whole foods plant-based diet and all of the risk factors begin to disappear. I've seen clients reduce their cholesterol levels in just weeks without medication. If you are educated, then you understand that drug companies fund most of the scientific research. So any therapy that works better and without dangerous side effects, such as lifestyle and nutritional therapies, never get enough funding. Nor do they make it to your local news or get published on every magazine cover. There's just no money in teaching you the truth about your risk for breast cancer and then empowering you to take charge. Now let's switch over to discuss the role that genes play in determining your risk for breast cancer. The BRCA gene mutation that was recently made famous by Angelina Jolie should not be on your high list of concerns. In fact, there is no current valid scientific information that tells us it should be a concern at all. And here is why. Less than a quarter of a percent of individuals in the general population carry the BRCA gene mutation. These genes are not solely responsible for the development of this disease. In fact, what science has shown us is that it is virtually impossible to isolate a single gene as a cause for disease. Research shows us that up to 98% of all women that have breast cancer do not carry the BRCA mutations. Just because you have certain genes does not mean they will be expressed. The majority of scientific evidence tells us that environmental and dietary factors as we've already covered, determines your outcome. But what if you are in this tiny minority of women who carry the BRCA mutation? Does this mean that you are at a higher risk for cancer? Is your risk for breast cancer really five times greater as being advertised? 
and is a double mastectomy an intelligent choice for you? Well, then let's begin with this. If you do have a family history of breast cancer, then yes, you may be at higher risk for breast cancer, but not because of genetic reasons. First of all, families don't just share the BRCA genes, they share other genes as well. They share a lot of similarities. They share similar lifestyles. And they also share similar diets. Do you see where I'm going with this? The numbers in the research on BRCA1 and BRCA2 are badly interpreted and highly, highly misleading. And to explain how manipulated, I will quote directly from the National Cancer Institute website. They say, it is important to note, however, that most research related to BRCA1 and BRCA2 has been done on large families with many individuals affected by cancer. Estimates of breast and ovarian cancer risk associated with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations have been calculated from studies of these families. Because family members share a proportion of their genes and often their environment, it is possible that the large number of cancer cases seen in these families may be due in part to other genetic or environmental factors. Therefore, risk estimates that are based on families with many affected members may not accurately reflect the levels of risk for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers in the general population. In addition, no data are available from long-term studies of the general population comparing cancer risk in women who have harmful BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations with women who do not have such mutations. Therefore, the percentages given above are estimates that may change as more data become available. And that's the end of the quote from the National Cancer Institute website. And in short, what it means is that the numbers showing an increased risk for women with the BRCA mutation don't mean much of anything at all at this point. But why? Why is this BRCA issue so heavily publicized in the media? And why is so much of our taxpayer money supporting it, supporting the research behind it? The answer is, of course, what we call checkbook science. And if you don't know what checkbook science is, then it's time to get an education. Diana Zuckerman defines the term checkbook science as research intended not to expand knowledge or to benefit humanity, but instead to sell product. In other words, to sell drugs, useless procedures, and so forth. And checkbook science is more common than people realize. According to a 2009 study from researchers at the University of Michigan Comprehensive Cancer Center, Nearly one-third of cancer research published in prestigious medical journals disclosed a conflict of interest, such as funding by the biotech industry, or even having an industry employee actually conduct and write the study. The report goes on to state, and I'll quote, Given the frequency we observed for conflicts of interest and the fact that conflicts were associated with study outcomes, I would suggest that merely disclosing conflicts is probably not enough. It's becoming increasingly clear that we need to look more at how we can disentangle cancer research from industry ties." End of quote. And we also know that 49% of reports on diet and health by the National Academy of Sciences are funded by the affected food and drug industries, which explains why people are sometimes so confused by health information that is being advertised daily on local news or other media outlets. The key point here is that consumers often cannot tell the difference between advertising and real science. Because sometimes advertising is camouflaged to look like real science. In checkbook science, the researchers work for the industry. They begin with the answer and they work backwards. And in addition to receiving direct payments, researchers are also allowed to hold equity in pharmaceutical companies. And so that if a drug becomes very profitable, due of course to positive research results, the researchers are well compensated. So it's no surprise that research published in the Journal of the American Medical Association showed that industry-sponsored studies were, and I quote, significantly more likely to show favorable conclusions relative to non-industry studies, end of quote. This includes hiding negative results or choosing not to publish them. This is one example where we have to be thankful to lawyers, because every few years, lawyers sued the drug companies for products that were allowed to hit the market even though they were clearly dangerous from the beginning, causing much harm to people who put way too much trust in a system that is clearly placing profit over human life. 
So now that we know what checkbook science is, let's get back to the topic of genetic testing and why it is being so strongly advertised for breast cancer. And the reason is simple. There is money to be made, a whole lot of money, in identifying genes and in scaring the public into diagnostic tests and treatments. Now as an exercise, let's follow the money behind the BRCA genes. The company responsible for this test, the same test that led to Angelina Jolie's decision to remove her breasts, is called Myriad Genetics. And 82% of its 2012 revenue came from its BRCA test, which pulled in $496 million. The cost of taking this test is approximately $4,000. Let me take a moment to explain to you that this is a simple blood test. So $4,000 is an outrage. This test can be provided for a lot cheaper. However, Myriad Genetics, at the time of the Angelina Jolie news, had a case open with the Supreme Court regarding the legality of its patents. In short, Myriad Genetics wanted to patent natural human genes to prevent academic centers from not only offering the test for a much lower price, but also to be prevented from doing further research, which falls in line with the definition of checkbook science, where it's not about the advancement of science for humanity, and it's all about the money. Thankfully, the Supreme Court ruled against Myriad Genetics, saying no, you cannot patent human genes. But all this just further illustrates how discovering these genes is huge business, and so is performing double mastectomies. But informing the public that we can reduce our risk for cancer to practically zero through nutrition and lifestyle alone, well, that's not good for business. You can't patent a healthy lifestyle. You can't patent whole foods, so there's no money there. It should be starting to make sense now. Dr. Colin Campbell asks us to consider why medical research organizations, such as the National Cancer Institute, declare that a majority of all cancers can be prevented by diet, but then they spend close to zero of their research budget to study exactly how. Who influences these decisions? Who votes on where the research money goes? And who decides what information to publicize to the public? Since we know that diet plays a huge role in cancer, why are doctors not required to have any formal training in nutrition? Let me end with this. Myriad Genetics will go on advertising their genetic test directly to the consumer. Now how scary is that to a person that doesn't know any better? And oncology will continue to remain the most lucrative field in all of medicine even though, when you look at non-manipulated statistics, which is a whole other topic for another video, you see that mainstream medicine has made little to zero advancement in cancer over the past four decades. In fact, cancer is replacing cardiovascular disease as the number one killer. No other business can make so much money, do so little to serve people, and yet still exist. Proving once more that our need to be educated as consumers has never been greater. But when we turn to real science, that which is ethical and serving a purpose to better humanity, we are taught what we can do to truly and dramatically reduce our risk for cancer. And it starts with our food. Nothing will prevent cancer more than a proper plant-based diet. Just reading the research on broccoli sprouts for the prevention of cancer is unbelievable. So incredible that one cancer researcher once noted that in his years of research on how to kill cancer, he never saw something more potent than broccoli sprouts. This is good news because it's in your hands. And I believe that you deserve to know that. To know that breast cancer won't just hit you one day because of your genes. To know that you yourself can be responsible and more conscious about the choices you make and how they affect you. To know that by being more educated, you will not succumb to fear and feel the need to remove body parts for no reason. We can do better than that.